Hello, Catholic YouTube. Brian with City of the Immaculata here, and uh, boy, do we have a do we have a good show for you today. Uh, this will be yet another first for City of the Immaculata, where we're breaking new ground here recently, living on the on the cutting edge. Uh, this will be the first time that we've had a guest on the show, and so of course this will be the first time I've had this particular guest join us, Miss Anne Marie Donlin. So, by way of introduction. Anne Marie Donlin has a Bachelor of Science degree in music education from Duquesne University and a Master of Music degree in piano performance from Ithaca College with postgraduate work studying Gregorian chant in the Ward Method at the Catholic University of America. She has taught piano and directed vocal and instrumental in New York State, Maryland, and Virginia. Anne Marie has also lived in Ireland where she taught at Walton's New School of Music and the Dublin Institute of Technology. She is the founder of the Little Sparrow Music Studio and she is currently a church organist and a choir master. Now, if I may move away from the formal introduction for a moment uh, to a more personalized intro here for my viewers. Uh, I know Anne-Marie personally and just a quick uh, backstory. So uh, my wife and I years ago were parishioners in a little parish uh, in Little City Parish, Jim Dorn was the organist there, and the late, great uh, Father Kaufman was our priest, God rest his soul. And uh, needless to say, we were spoiled liturgically. And then, uh, then we did the dreaded parish hop, and we joined another Little City Parish. Um, the, the priest assigned to that parish was one that we really wanted to support and get behind, though. And yet, despite being an amazing shepherd... Despite all that he was doing to, to renovate the parish and bring about better catechesis in the church, there was just something that was missing. And then one day it was as if the Red Sea parted and we got a new organist, a choir master, and the difference was night and day. Now, in my snapshot memory, Anne-Marie, and this was probably much different for you, I seem to remember the change being like almost overnight but it probably took you a bit longer in reality, but undoubtedly, and the only thing I can like it, liken it to, it was as if all of the things that we were doing, all of the elemental signs and actions of the sacred were just um, lifted up and elevated to our Lord through the music that, that, that um, came with you coming into this parish. And so, uh, Anne-Marie, thank you for taking the time to join us over here on my little corner of the internet, as I like to call it. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. This is exciting and uh, a little bit intimidating. So um, I'm honored with that introduction and uh, thanks so much. Yeah. So so I know, look, I, I, I like to think I know my talents and I know my weaknesses. And there's always like topics that I want to cover on this channel, but I'm not equipped to discuss them with the kind of knowledge and experience that someone like yourself brings um, to the table. And I actually, I don't know if you know this, Anne-Marie, but I'm a uh, amateur musician myself. Uh -huh. And, you know, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't, didn't know that. Well, I don't fool myself though, because uh, what I do is not what you do. I kind of, <laughs> I, I, I pluck out ballads and standards on the porch for my family. Oh, uh, yes. But everybody needs that. Right. But, you know, what you do, I, I think is something far more important. You know, you make the um, sacred, tangible for people every week. So I wanted to bring you on and get your thoughts on a few things related to music as a sacred art, um, as I know it's something that you take very seriously and really you've kind of dedicated your life to. So uh, without further ado, questions for you. Uh, what's the importance of sacred liturgical music? And related to that, what is the importance of voice and organ as liturgical instruments? Well, um, Holy Mother Church in uh, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, which is the document related to Vatican II, describes our treasury of music as the most important art. It actually uses the term inestimable treasure greater than that of any other art. So, I mean, we've, we've seen and we know what is in our church and in our church history, and boy, amazing works of art, amazing architecture, um, everything. But it places music as 
number one. Um, so if we don't take it seriously, well, shame on us. Um, the organ, right, and also in, in the same document, places the organ as, as the primary and most important instrument for liturgical and sacred music. Uh, the, the organ is most appropriate because its nickname is the king of instruments um, and how, how appropriate it's for the king of kings. So the organ can um, whisper like a little soft voice in the wilderness, or it can roar like the lion and, and introduce, you know, our Easter celebration or something along those lines. And the voice and uh, phrases related to singing or a to sing in the Bible are as one of the most uh, frequently repeated phrases. So singing, we were built to sing, we were built to sing in the worship of our Lord. And you said that was um, music um, sac sacrum, is that what it was called? Sacro Sanctum Concilium. Oh, those, the, yeah, you're talking about the, the Vatican II. Um, Vatican II. Mm -hmm. and there's another little short one, I think, that came out on sacred music. Um, Musicum Sancrum, I think, is what it's called. And I, I would recommend everybody go read those documents because they're beautiful documents. And the, the church has always stressed the importance of um, appropriateness and inappropriateness for the artistic things that we do. Um, used to express our worship of God. And so as a follow-up then, even though, uh, just for example, someone like Bob Dylan, right, um, he may be an amazing songwriter, why are certain styles and instruments not appropriate for liturgy? Well, what helps is to remind ourselves, even myself, um, is that our sacred liturgical music isn't about us and our preferences even if we prefer the greatest of music we have to look at what the church wants it's god's church how does he want us to worship so if you again look at church documents the church tells us that music has always been talked about and sometimes abused because well how uh, we're divas. <laughs> um, so we, we like to show off and oftentimes we need to, to trim our wings and, and be reminded, no, this isn't about you. Um, it's about God and his worship. So 1903, Pope St. Pius X had a document, Tra le Solicitudini, which um, he talks about uh, the model of sacred music, which the, prim, the supreme model of sacred music is Gregorian chant. And so he says that the further that music goes from that model, the less worthy of the temple it is. So literally, if you if you depart from that, so you have to kind of know what is Gregorian chant? What makes it the model? Well, it's a unison melody. Melody serves as the primary element. And if the other elements overtake the melody, then they are just not following that model. So you grab Gregorian chant, you see it as the model, and then you put whatever it is that you want to sing next to that. Is it similar? Does it does it take the same characteristics? So um, while we might love some certain composer or a certain song, if it doesn't represent the model, it's not worthy of the temple and it's God's temple, right? It's not like, hey man, but I love this stuff. And you gotta say, oh, God doesn't want me to worship in that manner. And would you say too, um, just just as a follow up to that, I mean, Bob Dylan might be a bad example because he'll probably have relevance in like 50, 60 years. But um, when when the when the changes to the liturgy were made in the 60s, there may be like, say, um, I don't know, like Peter, Paul and Mary or something. Right. That were relevant in 1960 uh, to to the culture then where 50 years later nobody knows right who who some of these people are and yet today um the 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 hymnals that we use these are uh, works that stand the test of time right would that be yeah that's a good judge actually um even for secular music how do you judge uh, music that stands the test of time is a great indicator like we know this is a great work of art beethoven's you know, fifth symphony is ninth symphony. Um, and so the same with sacred music, you can get, you know, little ditties that uh, some were down the line are like, what were they thinking? That's not, um, it, it's not gonna stand the test of time. You can't put ditties into the 
in there. <laughs> okay, so related to all of this then, because you were bringing up um, Gregorian chant, the, the development of Western music from a um, monophonic chant to to polyphony is really it's a fascinating history i like to also consider myself an amateur musicologist don't ask me any questions though um but do you, do you think there is a point at which polyphony becomes too much for the sacred music too much for sacred music say like certain high baroque composition and orchestration for example or do you think it has its place and the one thing that comes to my mind just to give you an example while I think, say, Mozart's Requiem for the Mass is a beautiful piece of music, wonderful and haunting, would that really be appropriate for a Requiem Mass, for example? Uh, that's a that's a very interesting choice because while a, a, an absolutely just amazing piece of music, but it isn't really appropriate for the liturgy. Part of what happened um, with the development of music is the length of time. Um, compositions begin to take up more and they began, you know, Baroque more decorative. And then Mozart, of course, into the classical era. So they they started to be very, very long. And that then became about the music and not the liturgy. So you're supposed to ornament and animate the actual liturgy. But if you start saying, you know, taking the Kyrie and extending it for 20 minutes, well, it's not really any more about the Lord and begging for mercy in the text Kyrie eleison three times right? Um, it becomes more about, wow, listen to the development of that melodic line, listen what the harmony did there, and we're not, it may be beautiful, absolutely beautiful, might take you to beautiful places, but it takes you out of the liturgy, you start going straight into the music. Um, yeah, so the Baroque era began to become longer. I mean, they they named, the church has named Palestrina in the documents, right, as, as a, a appropriate model of polyphonic music, so sure, use um, use that. It's beautiful. And the church inspires and encourages all types of music that follow the model and are appropriate from whatever era it may well be. But you have to then consider, is this too long? Or um, like in the Mozart Requiem, they use a choir and orchestra and solo voices. Um, in the sacred music, one of the things that Pope St. Pius X was opposed to and trying to um, trying to clip the wings a little bit was was opera right so in italy opera you know song of song of songs here great stuff but boy you don't put that in the mass so the mozart record while it's not opera they're soloists and then they're stunning beautiful solos um but they're not appropriate for the liturgy so great have a concert bring in everybody but make it a sacred concert not liturgical form that went a little bit long but <laughs> kind of had to explain a little bit no, that's wonderful. I mean, I've heard it. I can't remember where I heard it. If I, before, if I read it in passing, if someone told me this, but they said a general rule of thumb is if at the end you feel like you need to stand up and applaud, it might be too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, you 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 came into a parish uh, that had um, for years maybe. I wouldn't say neglected music, that was never the case. And it's not usually the case in most parishes, but music, um, as opposed to maybe what you would read in Sacrosanctum Concilium or in the On Sacred Music, um, music sort of took on a different, um, a different role, I would say. So for yourself, who's someone who's, who's well-informed on sacred music in the liturgy, what advice would you have for a, a um, organist or a choir director um, coming to a new parish that isn't used, the parish itself is not used to traditional liturgical music? Um, and what are maybe some of the challenges that they can expect to face? Well, I would first um, maybe just preface it by saying before you ever accept a job in um, the sacred music world, make sure that you um, just place that in prayer and speak to a trusted advisor because it's, um, well, it's just a place where you're going to find people pulling you in every direction. So you have to be ready. Someone might want you, what are you doing with that music? And another person, I can't believe you do. Please do this. You never do this. So you get from both sides. Please do. Please don't. Please do. And some are outright. They don't. And, I, and I'm, some of the people are very good hearted, but they don't realize that some of it's outright rude. 
Um, and so you have to be in a certain place to be ready to, to do that. So you would want to place it in prayer. Should I be applying for this job? Should I accept this job? And then make sure in the interview with the pastor that you're on the same page. So if your pastor doesn't have the same vision as, as you do for sacred music, it's, uh, I would say pointless because they're the one who, you know, it's their parish. So, um, and you also need the support. So when someone is coming to you, do this, don't do that. You need to go to the pastor and say, you know, this is some of the feedback I'm going or getting, or sometimes they go straight to him. You need your pastor to support you. Um, and then the other thing is, is um, so important. Rome wasn't built in a day. So um, I, I'd love certain things to be in the liturgy and, um, and you just can't, you can't do that overnight. Um, so you just got to do it one step at a time and, and educate people. Sometimes when people see and read those documents, like we've been talking about, read the documents of Vatican II, read um, Pope St. Pius X, and then the centenary of that anniversary, 2003, Pope St. John Paul II, just beautiful writing about music. And then it helps. So you want people to learn. The more they learn, the more they're going to want what you want, which is music for our Lord in his liturgy. Yeah, Rome was definitely not built in a day. And I think it's a bit, I, I mean, it's a bit ironic, I guess, where when you're, say, in your, I mean, I guess you would have to be, you would have been quite young, the people that are left alive that remember the liturgy before the liturgical reforms. And um, many of us, though, were raised on the post-liturgical reforms or maybe some of the set abuses that came out of that. Um, that the that the reforms themselves never called for. So, you know, if you're maybe if you're used to the guitar mass and the and the drums mass or the bongos or God God knows what people I've heard some crazy things. Um, it's almost as if you become to the point where you think that's actually the norm and what's expected, and then somebody like yourself maybe walks in and you are returning to some of the liturgical beauty. Uh, they maybe think that you're the innovator mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the wake of that. Um, yet I, I, I don't know whether we're, you know, our particular parish, um, maybe we're just a bit spoiled by the parishioners there because I've always gotten the sense, well, one, to the point that you were just making, you can never downplay the value of a great shepherd that's there to like, um, to pastor you and to pastor the people and I feel like the people get behind a good priest. And, you know, when you have a good priest, the people seem to know it. And um, I never really got the sense. It was almost as if when you came, Anne-Marie, um, it was like you were kind of always meant to be there was sort of, the, was sort of the sense that I got from the from the parish. And I, I don't know if you actually I mean, like you're saying sometimes maybe boots, you're kind of boots on the ground. Right. So you can see some of the some of the things that we don't get to see. But I always get the sense that like even though maybe something like Gregorian chant is a bit jarring for people when they first are introduced to it. Yet when it's done right, I feel like it's, it sinks in sort of like naturally into something that we are, um, it, it like taps into something that's innate within us. Um, and I don't know, Gregorian chant done right, if anybody could really like hate it, if that, that makes sense. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, you just touched on something. So a lot of people are trying to implement and to follow, you know, what Holy Mother Church wants and put Gregorian chant in there. But if you don't have, I don't know how else to say it, the horses to um, pull the cart. So if you don't have the capability of making it beautiful, it's going to come shocking coming from me, but um, I don't know that it should be put in there um, because if you can't make beautiful Gregorian chant, you're not going to have people love it. And what you want is, is people to love the chant and it has to be done right. So, um, you know, it's been so long since we had it, it's not a, a regular feature. People need to study it, to listen to it, and then figure out how can I bring this into my church? So you've got to have the horses um, and then, then you can build. So, you know, again, Rome wasn't built in a day, but there's so many resources now, like with very short, um, short uh, sort of 
simplified Gregorian chants start with some of those. Uh, again, that goes back to like a new director. Pick something simple that you can make beautiful and start with one, one of the antiphons or something like that, and then, then go to more. But people have to hear beautiful chant to understand why, why is this a model? Ugly Gregorian chant is not a model. <laughs> I, I have heard Gregorian chant done bad. And um, there's, if that's your introduction to it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard measuring stick. Um, but when you hear it done right, obviously, and actually to that um, hot take here, wh which is better, Gregorian chant or Byzantine chant? <laughs> um, a totally subjective opinion. <laughs> I, I, uh, I love Byzantine chant, but I, I still prefer Latin. I mean, the Byzantine is so otherworldly with that low, um, just basso thing out of nowhere. And it, it like that is church music, no mistaking it. But um, I personally love Gregorian chant, and it's my favorite. I, I would have to agree with you there. I mean, I've listened. I haven't listened to enough Byzantine chant, maybe to um, be able to say with with any degree of certainty. But um, there's there's just something about Gregorian chant that's um, it's 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 otherworldly. Well, I mean, I guess the otherworldly is not. It's it's heavenly, but it's also very earthy at the same time. Like there's mm. it 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 kind of like connects to something where it almost like it feels familiar, you know, and, and the way that like when I when I go out and, and approach the like the, the beauty of a sunset or, you know, a bird singing like it should that something like that should be kind of alien to us. Yet it's so familiar to us. And I feel like Gregorian chant kind of strikes me in that same yes. way. Yes. Yes. Well, they're, they've done um, studies, for instance. I mean, it was not a high quality study. Actually, it was more just an interview, but they took. um took their camera crew out to very rural India and played some music for them and then asked these people what they thought. So they didn't know Latin. Um, they didn't, hadn't experienced this music before. And, and they did both, they did Gr Byzantine chant and they did some Gregorian chant. And in both cases, one of the comments was, this music has been around for ages. Mm. Another one said, um, if I listened to this, I would know there was a God. Wow what wow so to our deepest core that music right is so otherworldly yeah straight to the heart so shifting gears here a little bit again would you tell us Anne marie who is justine ward and why is she amazing justine ward is an american uh 20th century uh woman who put together a comprehensive comprehensive music um educational system that focuses on the voice. So if you've heard of Kodai or Dalcros, um, she she predates them, so which is awesome. Um, so she her a matter of fact, her 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 um book is called That All May Sing. So when we are talking about liturgical music and the importance of singing and voice, she uh, wants everyone to develop their voice. So if you use this program, it it helps number one for students to to create a beautiful tone and for them to match pitch. Well, a very sad thing that I hear so frequently because I'm always looking for people to join my choir um, is uh, I can't, you know, I can't hold a tune in a bucket or, you know, I'm so toned up. But she uh, in her method will get every everyone to match pitch that all may sing and she doesn't accept that there are people who can't learn to sing. So, um, as the, the, she uses everything. So you use a movable dough system. You'll be able to read. So students, and this is aimed at elementary kids. So aimed at ages up to fifth grade, but they can read on a four line system. So they can read chant. Um, they can learn, learn on a five line system. They can read modern notation. There's nothing that stops them. They can, um, so they solfege, they sing everything. They compose little pieces. There's little um, dances, there's rhythm. Everything co is comprehensive um, and fun. I mean, the, these children just love it. Uh, I'm able to use it at the parish um, for the children's choir. And it's the most rewarding, so rewarding for me and for them. Um, so I can't speak highly enough about her. We should be promoting this, um, not just in Catholic schools, but public schools. Um, you know, when a child comes to me and they're 
they're in the, you know, high school years. Well, I never learned to read music. Well, how is that? It's like, you know, that's a required requirement of our school system. So anyway, Justine Ward, the Ward method is what it's called. And I can't speak highly enough about, about it. It's just, it's a gold mine. Yeah. You know, um, Isaac Newton once said that if I've seen further than anyone else, it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. And she is definitely a giant. I am, I've kind of in awe of what she managed to do. Do you know off the top of your head, did she have any precedent or did she kind of build from scratch her curriculum? She, well, she used um, vocal teachers and vocal technique and she would go visit them. So she visited, um, she went to Salem. Um, she spent time there and then there was other people. So she took their ideas and put them together. And um Montessori, so Marie Montessori. So they understand the, the human person and education and the child and education of the child. Um, so yeah, she borrowed from everywhere, but put it together in just such a, a great way. And it wasn't designed um, originally just for music teachers. So obviously I can, I can study this, get it and use it, but it was for the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. So you, you can figure this out and put it in your daily routine a 20 minute lesson and that's what should be in schools it shouldn't be a once a week i go to music as an extra you know that's my special no music should be a part of every child's school day so i didn't realize she went um, through salem now did she i guess i guess in her time um who was the was it dom prosper there was the there was the monk from salem that did the benedictine reforms of the liturgy with their famous chant right i mean that was yes like a... yes um so she she said to them well if, if i'm not doing my chant right then you show me so she spent some time there listening to them mm -hmm. and so even though she thought she knew what she was doing that again when you want the chant right you really have to spend some time immersing yourself in it so she did then tell me what i'm doing wrong and i have seen um i can't say that i'm familiar enough with it to um speak to it with any authority but if i remember right i've seen some clips of a classroom where a um, teacher was using the ward method and um if i remember right and correct me if i'm wrong here i think the teacher was having the students answer in tune like the like the student yeah, would re so it was response right yeah that's some of the things so um you know your students are a little bit shy at first but you might as some of the beginning to get them to sing as you you call an answer so good morning, how are you? And you toss them the ball or something. So it takes their mind off it and they say, I'm fine. And they throw it back. So you do a little call and answer. And that's the beginning of some um, almost improvisation. They can answer, I had a terrible day, <laughs> you know. Um, but the call and answer thing is always fun. You know, and some kids are hams and others are just shy. Fine. Um, and you just get them to, to use their voice. Now, I, um, I have had like actually arguments with people before. And I didn't realize that, I mean, it, it makes sense based on what she did, um, that Ward believed that any 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 child or any person for that matter, though when we get a little bit older, we get set in our ways. But for the very least for, for, a, for a child, um, that any anybody's capable of learning music if they, I don't believe in tone deaf. So I, I don't know, do you do you uh, ascribe to Ward there that that anybody can learn can learn this? I do. Um, when I first took the course, that was one of the questions I asked the teacher because I had, you know, I had heard a lot about Ward and knew of a lot of things, but the teacher said we can get anyone to match pitch. And I was like, wait, 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 stop right there. Because I had taught for a lot and I said, okay, so talk to me about this. And she said when she first started doing Ward. It would take her until Christmas, and then by Christmas, every child in her in her class could match pitch. And then she said, as I got better and did it over the years, it takes her now less than a month, every child. Wow. Just stunning. But I mean, Shinichi Suzuki, right, of the Suzuki method, his, his motto was, you're never too old or too young to twinkle. Um, so of course that you know violin and strings, but he just he, the music is in all of us. I think just the rustier we are, crustier we are, might take a little longer. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in a sense, um, people tend to um, mystify music, and I don't want to like. I mean, I'm not going to like. It wouldn't be my project to demystify music, right? Because there is something actually like beautiful and mystical about about music, but. Um, at the same time, it's it's a range, right? You know, you've got the low end, you've got the high end, and any instrument that you're working with 
is working within its particular range. So for, for my, my own particular take on it is that if, if you could learn math, if you can learn, you know, reading, writing, anything else that we assume a child walking into a school can learn, um, I think I just I, I think music falls within that same and it should be. I mean, I'm, I know I'm preaching pun intended. I'm preaching to the choir with you. Right. Um, but I don't I don't I don't know whether this is just maybe the um, coming coming from the, the the generation that we did out of the 70s and 80s and 90s, where some of these things were sort of left to the side. Um, I can't imagine many parishes um, implement the ward method. And that's that's kind of tragic to me, right? Where we have this, you know, I, I'm a convert to the faith, Anne-Marie. And so sometimes I have felt like Catholics sit on all of these like treasures and these gold mines. And they're like, don't even realize necessarily sometimes the treasures that we have. Um, and I, I, I mean, would you, do, do you know off the top of your head, is there like a percentage of how many like say parochial schools are doing what you're doing with the ward method? Are you like the exception to the rule or? Well, I would say, um, and I grew up uh, post uh, post changes. So I, I did not grow up with the, the old mass. I grew up with the new mass. And in my years, I would say in my era of Catholic schools, parochial schools, zero. I don't think they were doing that um, anywhere. And then I would say there's been a sort of a resurgence. Um, so groups like CC Watershed and the Chant Cafe and, um, you know, sacred music uh, websites and things like that have rediscovered it. Mm. So um, in the last, I would say in the last maybe 10 to 20 years, and now you're seeing it um, come up in like schools that are uh, charter schools. Um, some Catholic schools, so more and more. It's still not, certainly not utilized as much as it should be, um, but you hear of it. So now, like, um, you know, I was speaking with a, a priest from another diocese, and he said, oh, the ward method. Um, and he said, yes, we're using that both in the parish and the school. That totally unheard of, you know, when I was younger. Hmm. So total, it is rediscovered. Um, and, the you know, things by word of mouth and, and it's out of the mouths of those children when people hear the sound that a ward choir um presents it, it it's just speaks it's so beautiful that it brings people to tears um when it's done right so you know when people hear like well what are you doing i use the word method so it's it's spreading um certainly not fast enough but it's out there and uh, i don't think i think with the, the internet and ways we can communicate it's you know people can find out easier what it is and how to get there. Now, I, um, I didn't, I didn't prep you for this particular thing. So if you don't know, just like we can, I can maybe add it to the show notes, but um, this is going out to, you know, Catholic YouTube world. And if there's somebody, you know, be they um, somebody that works with a choir in their parish, or even just somebody that sits in the pews and they're this like picks their interest, do you have a suggestion of where they should start? Like, I mean, as far as like looking, yeah, for work. Well, Catholic University has um, the Ward Center, and that's where you should get trained. There are other places that are offering Ward, but you would want to make sure that it is approved by them because the last thing you need is um, like a, well, I know Ward, I can teach you. Mm, no. Um, so st stick with and start with Catholic U. In the summer, they have um, offerings. It, I don't think they have enough offerings, but I know everyone who does that is very, very busy and comes from all over the U.S. to to be there for that. So I would start with Catholic U um, and then they'll get you going and they they want this to be promoted. So they'll they'll try to help people as best they can. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, so before we leave then, I have one last one for you. Uh, and if you had to pick three pieces of music that fall into the, you must listen to this before you die category, what would those three pieces be? Well, um, Barber's Adagio for strings, right? So, wow, just that piece. I'm writing um, this down, by the way. Oh, <laughs> and there's lots of versions of that. So you can find it, um, obviously, for strings, but it's been arranged for lots of other things. So Barber Adagio for strings. Um, then there's the Reproaches. 
of Good Friday, the uh, pro properio, I can't ever say that part of it, but um, so the Benedictines of Mary have a, a very beautiful version of that. I, I, I think it's just one of the most beautiful liturgical um, pieces out there. Um, so Good Friday reproaches, amazing piece of music. And um, then there's an O Manu Mysterium, uh, which is Vittoria, Victoria, and that is, uh, you know, there's lots of versions of that text, uh, Christmas text, right, the birth of our Lord, but that one is uh, just so beautiful, love it, acapella choir, um, mm. so those are, so those are three, everyone should hear. <laughs> wow, so so you you obviously, your, your, your depth of knowledge on this is beyond mine. If I, if I had to pick something, I would be so basic, probably, I would probably say, like, like the Brandenburg and Sherito, right? Mm. I mean, um, that's not basic. That's good. <laughs> well, actually, I'll tell you one that's probably not. And I think I've brought him up to you before, and I don't remember your opinion on him, but I would really recommend um, Stravinsky's Firebird. Ah, yes. You know what? We did talk about that. That's a great piece of music. Yeah. Yeah. For, for <laughs> if, if you're, if you're interested in like, mo like modern music that's not, um, corrupted uh and um completely dissonant to the point where it's almost unlistenable for the average person i think stravinsky is a good um he's like a good medium between the old world and kind of the new world where he actually does um believe that things like melody is actually important right to a piece uh, and you know he actually he composed a, a latin mass i don't know if you're aware of that you know, we did talk about that and I still haven't looked. I need to go look that up. <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, you would think, oh, great. Somebody in the mid 20th century, Stravinsky composing a Latin mass. Like what, what do we, but it's very, um, it's very orthodox in its, in its approach to them. I mean, from my understanding, I don't know much about why he composed it, but I, um, you know, he was Russian himself, Russian Orthodox. And when he was part of the, um, you know, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia, he was one of the, his family were, had to immigrate out of Russia, right? Because of the, um, they were uh, considered bourgeois class. So um, his family would have been persecuted. And when he came to Paris, um, apparently he was just enamored with the Latin mass and just loved it and wanted to come in the, in the um, tradition and wanting to like show, show reverence towards it, composed his own Latin mass. And it's, um, it's quite beautiful in its own way. So yeah, I would recommend. Uh, well, the, the Adagio for strings, right? So um, he himself, the composer, later set that to an on use day. Mm. Um, so I think when a piece speaks to the soul, you know, sometimes liturgical things come out. Mm. Um, yeah, interesting. Well, Emery, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And if you um, would like, I would love to um, pick your brain further um, in the future at some point, if you would mind coming back someday. I would be very honored. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Emery, And uh, we will see you next time then. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye.